Hello and welcome to Inventing Civilization, the YouTube channel where I take a closer look at the history of political thought and philosophy. My name is Eric and in this episode we'll talk about Sun Tzu and the art of war. How many times am I going to butcher this man's name in a single video? Sun Tzu has become famous for the military treatise The Art of War, but the exact origins of the art of war are a bit fuzzy. It is traditionally believed to have first emerged in the late spring and autumn period, around the same time when Confucius was alive. However, a lot of the content is far ahead of the reality of the spring and autumn period. War in the spring and autumn period was a poorly organized affair with rudimentary weaponry on a relatively small scale. It wasn't until the following Warring States period that warfare became professional and organized with the kind of advanced iron weaponry that's mentioned in the Art of War. Now this would suggest that the Art of War came to be completed over the course of several decades or even centuries. One thing is for sure, however, the Art of War, like the Analects of Confucius, were inspired by a particularly chaotic chapter in China's history when the foundations of civilization appeared in peril and war and violence were on the rise. First, you need to get the idea of a single man writing a single book out of your head. That's not what happened. A lot of the materials that make up the art of war were passed on orally and gathered, collated and refined by generations of students much later. The process is somewhat comparable to how the Analects of Confucius came to be, except the history of the art of war is littered with even more question marks. Sun Tzu, spelled more correctly in modern pinyin like this, translates into Master Sun, which is not something anyone would go about calling himself. The title Tzu, or Master, was therefore bestowed upon a man called Sun by others, and likely after his death. This means we're looking for a man called Sun, who may have stood at the origins of the art of war. Tradition has it that this man was called Sun Wu, and he was a contemporary of Confucius in the late spring and autumn period. But we have nothing in the way of a biography of this man, save for a rather fantastical tale about how he came to be employed by the King of Wu as a military advisor. And then, over a century later, during the Warring States period, there was a man called Sun Bin, who allegedly descended from Sun Wu. Now we know a lot more about Sun Bin than we do about Sun Wu, and his story is a lot more credible. Both men were referred to as Sun Tzu, or Master Sun, and both men wrote military treatises. Both treatises were unearthed as separate documents in the 1972 archaeological excavation of the Yin Keixian Han slips near Yin Yi, but there is some overlap between the two documents, which begs the question, who wrote what? The simple truth is that we don't know, but we need to consider that we may be asking the wrong question in the first place. In ancient China, works of literature were rarely an individual effort. They were often a collection of teachings from different sources that were originally passed on orally and were then collected and edited so they could be gathered in a work of literature that was usually the product of contributions of several writers over the course of several decades or even centuries. Authorship in ancient China was a communal effort. So the question who actually wrote The Art of War is one that doesn't currently have a satisfying answer. Now obviously, as a military treatise, The Art of War mostly concerns itself with the business of warfare, which I won't cover to any great detail because it lies outside the scope of this channel, but it had important implications for how the state was organized and run from a political perspective as well. Sun Tzu's The Art of War and Confucius's Analects have similar origins and they were inspired by the turmoil facing China at the end of the spring and autumn period and during the Warring States period, but they looked for solutions to China's woes in different fields. As we discussed in the previous episode, Confucius focused his argument on the structure of civil society, but Sun Tzu was more concerned with the survival of this state and therefore focused his argument on foreign policy and defense. Where the Analects espouses certain idealism, the art of war embraces realism. Sun Tzu said the art of war is of vital importance to the state, a matter of life and death, a road to either safety or ruin, a subject, therefore, that cannot be ignored. So, what practical implications did this have for the structure of the state? First of all, rulers, in the eyes of Sun Tzu, should lead their people by setting a moral example based on Tao. 
Sun Tzu believed that convincing the people their cause was just was vital in maintaining their support and winning any conflict. This notion would seem to be no different from Confucius, but the devil is in the detail. To Confucius, Tao was a way of life centered on such concepts as virtue and benevolence. But Sun Tzu combined that with the dominant notion in ancient China that humans were communal beings to emphasize the importance of hierarchy and obedience. The Art of War contains a detailed explanation of using punishments and rewards to keep the men in line. And all of this made the leader less of a father figure and more of an authority. Secondly, rulers should surround themselves with military advisors or generals, whereby in matters of war at least, the leader would let himself be guided by his generals, giving them almost free reign. Now this seems obvious to us today, but it marked a break with tradition in ancient China at the time. You have to remember that during the spring and autumn period, rulers were surrounded by civil bureaucrats and they would lead their armies themselves in rather amateurish campaigns. Sun Tzu suggested nothing short of a professionalization of warfare, which is something that had never been attempted before. Thirdly, Sun Tzu believed war should be an absolute last resort, and that if war was inevitable, it should be as brief and minimally costly and damaging as possible. Now, This is important because it inspires everything the art of war has to say on planning and strategy. Ancient China did not glorify warfare like Greek and Roman civilizations did. They didn't celebrate the brave warrior hero. War in ancient China was a tragic matter of no alternatives. This is why Sun Tzu, for example, places a tremendous emphasis on spies and intelligence, because knowing your enemy and feeding him misinformation was a very cost-effective way to both increase your chances of victory and of keeping the war as short as possible. But war to Sun Tzu was always Plan C. Plan A was avoiding war, through, for example, diplomacy and alliances. Since war was a costly affair for everyone involved, Sun Tzu reasoned there was always opportunity to strike a compromise that kept the peace. Plan B consisted of strong defenses that would make your enemy think twice about attacking you. But launching an offensive yourself, well that was only Plan C and any general who pondered this option should be guided by a desire to keep the conflict as short as possible. So to sum this all up, Sun Tzu had a more realistic approach to the architecture of the state than did Confucius. Rather than relying only on civil bureaucrats, Sun Tzu suggested leaders should surround themselves with capable generals because the art of war was crucial to the survival of the state. The leader should use Tao to both be a moral symbol to his people and to make his people support his cause. War was to be avoided but, if necessary, should be brief because even military victory constitutes a defeat in the sense that it amounts to a loss of manpower, revenue and other resources. The legacy of the art of war has moved far beyond the actual armed conflict. With regards to political science, it was vital in arguing that war was integral to the survival of the state. But it is not a warmongering work of literature. It combines a blueprint for the professionalization of warfare with strategies that are based on the notion that actual armed conflict is to be avoided at almost all cost. Now, the art of war, like the Analects of Confucius, aimed to formulate an answer to how we can ensure the stability and well being of the state during a turbulent chapter in China's history. Although both sought solutions in very different fields, their answers were largely complementary. There is no inherent contradiction between Confucius's desire to organize the workings of the state in a moral fashion and Sun Tzu's conviction that the state should be ready to defend itself through military means if necessary. Unsurprisingly, the art of war has had its biggest impact in Asia. But even there it remained relatively isolated to China and its immediate surrounding civilizations for a long time. The first real foreign translation was that into Japanese around 1750. The first Western translation was then into French in 1772, and the book wasn't translated into English until 1905. These days, the art of war serves two main purposes. The first is a military treatise for those studying war, which is extremely important because it serves as a crucial counterweight to traditional Greco-Roman glorification of warfare, and secondly as an annoying marketing gimmick to sell self-help books or business management tutorials. But, the fact of the matter is that Western civilization continues to glorify warfare and violence. As the first English translation of The Art of War is now 110 years old, 
we have really run out of excuses to do so. I, for one, can't wait for the day when we finally embrace that most fundamental teaching of Sun Tzu, which is that war is a destructive abnormality that should be avoided. If you'd like to learn more about Sun Tzu and the art of war, there's an excellent website you should visit first. It's called sunshu.com. Now, I want to make it clear that I am in no way affiliated with this website and they're not paying me to mention their URL. It just is a very good resource for Sun Tzu's The Art of War. The website is the product of a network of professionals and it also hosts an overview of some of the best books that you can read on the subject of Sun Tzu. For this video, I rely chiefly on Victor H. Mare's The Art of War, Sun Tzu's Military Methods from 2007, Roger Ames's Sun Tzu, The Art of Warfare from 1993, and the translation of The Art of War by Dr. Thomas Cleary. If your interest lies predominantly in political science and you'd like to really edify yourself on the subject of Sun Tzu, these three books will be enormously helpful to you. But, on the other hand, if you're a military professional, then you should consider reading the translation by Samuel B. Griffith from 1963 originally. Now this book predates the 1972 archaeological excavation of the Yinke Shanghan slips near Yingyi, which does put it at a slight disadvantage, but the author, Samuel Griffith, was a brigadier general in the US Marine Corps as well as a Chinese military history buff, and his perspective and footnote comments are probably more interesting to anyone of a military background. Well, that concludes this video. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. I'd like to thank you very much for watching. See you next time. Goodbye.